Well, I'm glad to see you all. Leo and Dawn, I didn't see you come in. Good morning. Good to see you. You ever had someone visit with you or talk to you and and they just give you so much information that you can only take so much in? Uh, I think that's a little ADD in all of us, I'm not sure, but we, we can only handle so much at a time. And what we've been studying has been a conversation that Jesus has been having with his disciples in the upper room Thursday evening before he goes to the cross on Friday, and Jesus absolutely has his disciples' head spinning. They're, they're swimming in information. They're in a state of shock almost. And he's, he's going to change the subject matter on them again and start to tell them about what's coming. And that's what we're going to study this morning in chapter 16, the Gospel of John. Chapter 16, we're going to read verses 1 through 11 together. And then we'll, uh, we'll just camp out in this paragraph and then we'll uh, look at the scripture a little more closely. Jesus says, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. But now, oh, I'm sorry, I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, about righteousness and judgment, about sin because people did not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can no longer see me, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Right in the beginning there, verse 1, Jesus says, All of this I have told you so that you will not fall away. All of this what? <laughs> this conversation that Jesus has had with the disciples has been going on for four chapters in the book of John. It started in the, in the upper room with foot washing. He's told them all of this and all these things so that they wouldn't fall away or rather apostatize themselves. In the King James Version, it says that ye should not be offended. What is it that Jesus has shared with his disciples that's so offensive? So offensive that he told them in advance so they wouldn't fall away. He has spoken plainly to them, but they can only absorb so much information. The conversation in the upper room began back in chapter 13, and up until this point, the conversation has provided example, it's provided instruction, and it's provided encouragement. But now the conversation is going to highlight or is going to shift to highlight Jesus' omniscient power. He is God, after all. He can see into the future. And he will use this power as a forewarning to the disciples or for the disciples. Like I said, in chapter 13, Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, helping them understand humility, and all the while dismissing Judas the traitor and predicting that Peter would deny him three times. In chapter 14, Jesus comforts the disciples, explaining that he is the way to the Father and that they should believe in him as they have believed in the Father. It's also in chapter 14 that he promises them the gift of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 15, Jesus explains that he is the true vine, and that they should abide in him, and that they should love one another. But it's at the very close of chapter 15 that the tone takes a very heinous turn 
very dark term, is from the context of, of hate that Jesus forewarns his disciples. Now, I just want to read again to you the end of chapter 15. It's what we studied last week, but the flow of chapter 15 falls right into what we're studying this morning. John 15, verse 18, starting there, Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as, it own, as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. Remember that I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who has sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates the Father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. But this is to fill what is written in their law that they hated me without reason. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Again, Jesus says, I've told you all of this so that you won't fall away. He's told them that the world's going to hate them because it first hated him. He's told them that the world's going to hate them because they are not of the world. And he's told them that they're going to hate them because they don't know God. He goes on to say in verse 2 of our text, back in John chapter 16, that they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, he says, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that they are offering a service to God. Now listen, out, to be put out of the synagogue is much more than us thinking about being excommunicated or kicked out of the church, okay? If you are put out of the synagogue, you are put out of the Jewish culture altogether. You're not only going to lose your religious rights, but you're going to lose your cultural rights. You're going to lose your employment. You're going to lose your family. You're going to lose your ability to do trade or commerce in the public marketplace. And what's that leave you as a Jew? That leaves you as a beggar because you have no rights anymore. You're culturally and socially shunned. Okay, So being kicked out of the synagogue is a big deal. We see in back in John chapter 12, there's an example of some of the Jewish leaders had believed in Jesus. And this is what John writes. He says, Yet at the same time, even among the leaders, they believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. Why? For they loved human praise more than God. Listen, people have been holding back their true feelings about God for a long time. Well, when, when we are tempted to deny our faith because we're afraid of what someone will say, it's nothing new. People have been doing this a long time, okay? But they're guilty of it because they're afraid that other men will kick them out of the synagogue. There's another example in John chapter 9 when the parents of a blind man are brought in for questioning by the Pharisees. This is what they say. We say, we know that he is our son. He is, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But we cannot now say who opened his eyes. We don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. They were chicken. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. They weren't going to answer. 
They were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. They, they were comfortable in letting their uh, grown son answer for himself. However, if you noticed in our text, being put out of the synagogue wasn't the worst thing that could happen. Jesus says, anyone who kills you, anyone who kills you will think that they are offering a service to God. I don't know, it's been about a year ago, maybe a little longer. I saw a news report and uh, the news report said that I think it was 13 Egyptians were beheaded by ISIS. What the news didn't tell you is those 13 Egyptians, they were Christians. You see, people are going to kill because of Christianity. And they think that they are doing it, in that certain case, in service to Allah. It's happening, folks, all over the world. I shared with you last week, 72 million martyrs since the beginning of Christianity. And two-thirds of them, they think, have been martyred in the last two centuries. That's, that's an incredible number of people that have been killed for the name of Jesus Christ. To be killed, as Jesus said, the time is coming, anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God, this would be an example of religious zeal out of control. And that's what's going on with ISIS and ISIL. They're radicalized, and they think they are doing a great service to God. The Jews back then who were going to kill Christians uh, were trying to run down these blasphemers or kill them with religious fervor. They were, they were religion, religious crazy. They were Jewish crazy. They wanted to stomp out all the Christians. The Jews would consider killing them to equal presenting sacrifices to God. Instead of, instead of bringing a sacrifice before the altar, they'd just go out and kill a Christian. and That would be service for God and doing a service for him. Paul was one of those when he was Saul of Tarsus. There's an example of him talking about his zeal with King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. This is what Paul says. He says, I too was convinced that I ought to do what was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I have tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. Paul was zealous for Judaism. He was going to make an effort in stomping out Christianity. He was zealous for it. And why? Well, Jesus says in verse 3 of our text, he says, they do such things, and I've been forgetting to slide ahead, sorry. He says, they will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. They could have known Jesus. He spoke plainly. He did his works in front of them with uh, prophecy fulfilling wisdom. He demonstrated great authority through all of his miracles that they witnessed, yet they did not believe that he was deity. They didn't believe he was God. Why? They already had a God. His name was Jehovah. And they didn't think that Jesus had any right of saying that he was from God, that he and the Father were one. Listen to them, listen again to the condemning words that Jesus shared about them in the last chapter. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had come, or if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also as well. If I, had done, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, 
they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. The Jews wouldn't believe in Jesus, even though he had testified with such wisdom and clarity, even though he had performed miracle after a miracle to back up his claims that he was deity, they wouldn't believe in him. So in verse 4, Jesus reiterates the warning to the disciples. I've told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. Jesus says, when their time comes, he's talking about the Jews. What does he mean by when their time comes? He means that the time will come when they will persecute the disciples after he leaves and existentially the church and even us. The time will come when we might even be persecuted and we need to be ready. Jesus is forewarning us that we might be persecuted because of his name. The Jews' time came for uh, the man named Stephen in Acts chapter 6. It's recorded by Dr. Luke in Acts chapter 6. He says in verse 8, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue, of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom that the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words about Moses and against God, so they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and they brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. They said, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. The time came for the Jews also against the apostles. Every single one of the disciples, except for John, was martyred. Every single one of them lost their life. Now to me, that is one of the greatest arguments for Christianity. Why would 11 men go to their death for a lie? They wouldn't. But if you, actually, if you actually witnessed somebody executed, crucified on a cross, a spear thrust into his side, and you saw the blood and the water come from his heart that had exploded in his chest, and you knew that he was dead, you saw where he was buried, and then three days later you saw the same man alive, you'd be willing to die for that, wouldn't you? You'd be willing to die for it because you know it's true. And that's what these 11 men saw. And they were martyred. It's, it's interesting that the word martyr in the Greek means to witness. But since Christians have been killed over and over and over for witnessing about Christ, they've been given the name martyr. So why would Jesus want them to remember that they had been warned? Warned by him about the persecution they would face. Well, could you imagine if the persecution came and Jesus hadn't warned them? If he hadn't told them that this was coming? Would the persecution make any sense in light of Jesus leaving? If he was no longer there, and then all of a sudden they started being persecuted, beaten in the synagogues, which they were. You can read in Acts chapter 6. Hunted down by men like Saul of Tarsus, which they were. You can read in Acts. Don't you imagine that the disciples took great comfort in knowing that this was coming, and when it occurred, they said, oh yeah, Jesus told us. 
that this was going to happen. I know they did. First, in, in Peter writes about it in his first epistle in chapter 4. This is what he says, and, and we need to take these words to heart because this is all about what could happen to us as Christians. Dear friends, Peter says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice. There's a hard part. How do you rejoice when you're being persecuted? I don't know. I've never been persecuted like that. But he says, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Peter says, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. Let me repeat that. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. If someone calls you a filthy, rotten Christian and that you're a fool to believe in a fairy tale called Christianity, guess what? If you stand firm, you're blessed. You're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God will rest upon you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name for it is for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. That means us. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faith, faithful creator and continue to do good. Peter's trying to encourage us. He says, if you suffer because of being a Christian, don't give up, but continue to be righteous. Continue to do good works. Continue to say good things. Rejoice and be glad that you're suffering for the name of Christ, for you will be rewarded. But Jesus did not tell his disciples all these things in the beginning. What sense would it have made for him to tell them in the beginning all of these things? It means that if he did, they would be very confused. What kind of ministry starts off with, follow me? And you'll receive great persecution. That's not very good salesmanship. Remember what he said to Peter? He said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. You see, when Jesus was alive, when he was physically with the disciples, all the persecu persecution that occurred was directed at him, never at the disciples. He received all the persecution. So there was no need for Jesus to tell them in the beginning of his ministry, this is going to happen. He had three years, after all, to explain and build them up in character, to build them up in fortitude, to build them up in faith. And that's what he did. In verses, oh, I was on the wrong one. We're going to have to get a tech guy or a tech girl because it's hard to keep track of both. In verses 5 and 6, Jesus says, But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I had said these things. The 11 disciples can't see past themselves. They're consumed with their own suffering, with their own grief. They're not thinking about Jesus at all. Yes, they had asked him where he was going. Thomas even said, we don't know where you're going. But they didn't ever let Jesus continue the conversation. They were too worried or consumed with their own feelings. So it's now in this text that Jesus will tell the disciples that he is going to the Father and that his departure will come 
and the Holy Spirit will come as the advocate. In verse 7, he says, Very truly, truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus must finish his work for the Holy Spirit to come. He doesn't say why. He just says, if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come. He says, when I go, the Holy Spirit will come. Jesus' work is accomplished on the cross. And with that work, the Holy Spirit can come as promised. Peter says in Acts 2.33, as he's preaching the great sermon, he says, Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. William, William Hendrickson asks this poignant question in his commentary. He says, as long as the disciples see Jesus in the body, are they able to understand that their relation to him must be of a spiritual character? If you see Jesus... If you're looking at him and you see him physically manifested in front of you, are you going to think that your relationship is going to exist in a spiritual character when he's right there in the physical presence of you? You're not even thinking about spiritual matters. Strange indeed are the ways of God. Hendrickson goes on to say that the basic reason why Christ's departure means triumph and not tragedy is this that otherwise the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to them. Reading on in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we understand that the Holy Spirit is a gift from Christ's work. Uh, Acts 2, 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift is not given until the task for which it is given has been accomplished. So the Holy Spirit cannot come until Jesus has finished his task on earth. Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and about righteousness and judgment. First, about sin, because people do not believe in me. In Acts chapter 2, verses 36 and 37, this is just prior to what we read. G, or Peter says to the crowd, he's preaching this great sermon, and there's at least 3,000 people there because 3,000 were baptized on this day. But there's this huge crowd, and he says, Therefore... Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And in response, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Listen, they were convicted. They were convicted about their sin. They realized that they had put Jesus to death, the Messiah, that he wasn't guilty. And they were cut to the heart. The Holy Spirit convicted them of their sin. Jesus says that about righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can no longer see me, and about judgment, because of the prince of this world now stands condemned. Those are two verses that I found very confusing. I didn't understand them really at all, just looking at them. How, how is this about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can no longer see me? Well, in Hendrickson's commentary, he says that the world represented by the Jews was about to crucify Jesus. So when we're talking about the world, it's represented by the Jews. It was going to say, the world was, he ought to die. So in the name of righteousness, they thought they were putting him to death. They proclaimed aloud that he was anything but righteous. 
and they treated him as an evildoer. But the exact opposite was the truth. Though rejected by the world, he was welcomed by the Father, welcomed home via the cross. The cross which led to the crown. He was about to die, and he was about to receive his reward, both at the same time. By means of the resurrection, the Father would place the stamp of his approval on his life and work branded as unrighteous, would by means of his victorious going to the Father be marked as the righteous one. They thought they were putting to death something or someone unrighteous. But when he resurrected and he went to the Father, he was proclaimed the righteous one. Thus, the world would be convicted with respect to righteousness. What's that mean? It means that we don't have a clue about righteousness. Our righteousness is filthy rags in the eyes of God. We're not righteous at all. Jesus is the righteous one. And the fact that he conquered death proves that he's the righteous one. And then this conviction would result in the world's condemnation that is, the condemnation of Satan and all of those men who refused to repent. There were gods of them who refused. They saw all the evidence, but still they refused to repent. Hence, the world, by clinging to the advice of Satan and condemning Jesus, stands convicted. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Convicts men about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Without the gift of the Holy Spirit, we have no idea of the three of them. So summing it up, it has, been, it has become evident that through the preaching of the gospel, the Holy Spirit helps the church, and that he does this by convicting the world with respect to its own sin of not believing in Christ, with respect to righteousness of Christ, who is going to his Father is fully vindicated, and with respect to judgment of God pronounced on the, on the prince of this world. And to that, I say faith is a victory. O oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. We don't understand all these things, but we do have a glimpse of the idea about righteousness, about judgment, and about sin because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to die so that he could atone for our sins. Jesus had to raise from the grave and ascend into heaven so that we could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I've often heard people say that when they get to heaven, they'd like to ask Moses a question, or they'd like to ask uh, Adam a question, or they'd like to ask King David a question. What was it like to, to kill Goliath? What was it like you know, to, to uh, uh, be chosen king when someone else was already king. And all those are interesting questions. But do you realize when we get to heaven, they're going to come and say to you, what was it like to have God living inside of you? We take the Holy Spirit for granted. The Holy Spirit is what leads us into truth. It's what helps us understand Scripture. Without the Holy Spirit, we would be lost. We, we wouldn't understand half of what Jesus ministered about. We wouldn't understand half of Paul's writings. But because of the Holy Spirit, we actually have this living and breathing true document to guide our lives by. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this morning. Thank you so much, Father, for the gift of your word. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son. I just pray, Father, that you would help each one of us realize how precious a gift that was. Help us realize, Father, that the work done on the cross was in preparation for the Holy Spirit to come. It was in preparation for us to be pronounced holy and blameless in your sight. 
Father, help us never take for granted the suffering that Jesus did on our behalf. Help us never take for granted, Father, the gift that he's given us, the ability to be forgiven and to go to heaven when we die. Father, as we prepare our minds for communion now, I just pray that you would uh, draw our thoughts back to the cross, that uh, our hearts would be wide open to um, what the gifts or what the uh, emblems mean. Uh, Father, help us to think about all that Jesus suffered not only on the cross, but in preparation for the cross. And Father, most of all, help us realize that that perfect one who hung on the cross had all of our sins placed upon him. All of our sins. I know mine are too numerous to count. But all of our sins for all time were placed upon him and crucified once and for all and were no longer held accountable or liable for them. Father, just uh, forgive us for all of our evil thoughts, all of our evil actions. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.